as I said, my name is Megan Motto. I'm the CEO of the Governance Institute of Australia, and I'd like to thank everyone for joining us here today. Uh, I'd like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the lands where we meet, where, where all of us meet, wherever you are in Australia or even perhaps elsewhere uh, around the globe. I'm in Sydney, so I'm on the land of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging that are with us today. And just to make a special note about uh, my personal thanks for uh, the traditional people's custodianship of the land. Custodianship is a, a concept that's become very important to me in particular since I joined the Governance Institute because as governance professionals, we are the custodians of our organisations and institutions, not uh, natural lands, but certainly the institutions which we hope to carry forward in a sustainable way to make a brighter future. So look, thank you so much um, for having me here today. I am going to introduce our fantastic panel in a moment. Um, but I thought I'd just start by saying, um, you know, like I'm guessing almost all of our attendees, you've signed in today because you are passionate about diversity. You're interested in diversity and inclusion. You're passionate about diversity. And I've certainly been passionate about diversity um, for some obvious reasons, uh, I particularly around the gender space for a very long time. In fact, in a previous organisation, uh, I started the first mirror group of the male champions of change um, with the assistance of Elizabeth Broderick. And uh, in going along that journey, um, one of the things that I very much realised, and it's part of the reason that, well, it's in fact, a large part of the reason that we're here today, and that is um, passion is about more than just words. Passion is about words turned into actions that make a difference. And so the one thing that I'd say is that anyone that says to you, you know, I'm very passionate about diversity because I want my daughters to have the same opportunities as my sons or, or any of the, those type of statements that you hear quite often, you know, the next question to be asked is, well, what actions are you taking? And I say that intentionally because what we'd like to leave you with uh, today at the end of this hour is some actionable items that you could take, irrespective of whether you're here on an employer capacity or perhaps you're looking for a directorship. We'd like to give you some actionable points at the end of this. Um, in talking about that action, of course, in business, what gets measured gets done. And so it's really, really important that we know the numbers. And we've made great progress uh, over, the, over the years with regards to knowing you know, how much of a gap there is on the diversity front in our organisations. Obviously, the reporting requirements through WGIA have, uh, you know, really signalled the requirement for large organisations to report their numbers. But I think significantly right across the spectrum, organisations are understanding that to be an employer of choice, particularly in this very hot market war for talent that we find ourselves in, it's really important to know your numbers. So the first thing that I'd say uh, we are we're going to talk about some numbers today that uh, have come out of the work that Watermark does with the Governance Institute in terms of the top line numbers. But individually in your organisations, the first thing that you need to do is you need to know your numbers. And that goes to pay gap analysis. That goes to it's no good saying we, uh, you know, we want to be diverse. You have to know your numbers because you have to know your benchmark that you're starting from. So one thing that we're not going to focus on today is the business case for diversity. I'm going to take it as an absolute given that all of our attendees get that diversity is good for decision making in organisations. There is a plethora, plethora of research from McKinsey and Catalyst and the Big Four and, and all sorts of organisations, chief executive women and the like, over the years that point to the business case for diversity. So we're not going to dwell on that. We're going to move quickly uh, past that. Um, however, in saying that, if COVID and the border shutdowns in Australia in particular have taught us anything is that there has been a massive intensification of the war for talent. And so we cannot leave large swathes of the opposite gender or minority groups or our people that aren't uh, you know, over a certain age, we cannot leave that talent on the table. We need to be thinking differently. And that's really what this conversation is about today. So I'm uh, very, very excited. As you can tell, I am passionate. And, uh, and so I'm really, really thrilled to be here today. Um, 
I would probably uh, like Ben to stray straight in and introduce our wonderful panellists. Now, first and foremost, we have David Evans, uh, who is the managing partner of Watermark Search International. Now, Watermark approached Governance Institute. They've actually been doing this research for, uh, I think it's five years now, David, but partnered with the Governance Institute for the last two years. Um, we, once again, at the Governance Institute are thrilled to partner because we believe that knowledge is power and knowledge creates action. So very, very happy to partner on this research. Uh, David's responsible for leadership strategy and direction of Watermark Search International. And as I said, the second year that we've partnered and, and hopefully a long partnership going forward. So I'll introduce, uh, I'll throw to you in a moment, David, to uh, go through the research findings of this year. And there's some great stuff in there, some good nuggets. I will just introduce, however, our other two panellists that we're very fortunate to have here. Uh, first, and, and uh, we've got internationally experienced leader, Shirley Chowdhury. So uh, Shirley, welcome and thank you very much for joining us. Uh, Shirley's got credentials across law, financial services, funds management, the NFP sector. <laughs> little bit of feedback on my end, that's all right, I hope that's gone, and including Indigenous education and journalism, so really broad, uh, broad areas of expertise there. Shirley's most recent executive role was CEO for the GO Foundation, founded by Adam Goodies and Michael O'Loughlin, and uh, she's currently a non-executive director of Australian Associated Press and chair of the advisory board of Octodoc, a health tech startup. Also on our panel joining us today is Jason Yatsen Lee. Um, I hope I've got that correct, Jason. Uh, Jason's Chairman of Investment Group Vantage Asia and Managing Director of Corporate Advisory Firm YSA. He's also a Pro Chancellor at the University of Sydney and also Chair of Refugee Talent a director of Asia Link, and I'm going to um, talk a little bit about the Asia Link research that was conducted a couple of years ago into Asian ready directors or Asian capable directors, and an advisory board member of China Matters and a young global leader of the World Economic Forum. Well, with credentials like that, we're in for an absolutely sterling conversation. But to kick things off, and before we go to the survey results, we want to include you, our audience. So we've got a couple of poll questions. And the first poll question is going to come up onto your screen now. And this is because we're trying to get a feel for who is in our audience today, who's uh, interested. So if you would let us know what your current role is, uh, you can only choose one. So if you're a jack of many trades like some of us, then you'll pick the one that you feel that you're here in that capacity today. Are you a chair, a director, an executive or an interim executive? And uh, so that would be great. And I think we can have those poll results up on screen fairly shortly. And I will then throw to David. Now also keep in mind, that you can ask us questions and this will be an interactive forum. So I will be throwing to your questions uh, uh, um, through the course of, of the, the time. Um, I'm sure that we're going to get lots of them. So uh, please get your questions in through the Q&A chat. It seems that we've got lots of board members and executives uh, with us today. So on that note, David, I'm going to throw to you to take us through this year's survey results. Thanks, Megan. Uh, delighted to, to be here and welcome everyone to the to the discussion. It's a pleasure to have you. So as Megan touched on, we've been doing this for quite a few years um, and we cover ASX 300 and we uh, cover five aspects of diversity. Um, so you can go to the next slide. Thanks, Alicia. And so um, <clears throat> we feel that, you know, the conversations moved on from gender, certainly want to talk about that, but there's other components as well we want to touch on. Um, that we're seeing some interesting trends. And because we've been doing it um, for over five years, we're getting some powerful trends and we've even been game enough this year to do some predictions. So that's always thought with danger, but we thought we'd have a go at it. So let's let's go to the next slide if we can. So on gender, um, <clears throat> you know, it's been a great year in movement in this. You know, we've achieved the 30% female benchmark, which has long been a goal of the ASX 300, and we've certainly achieved it for the first time. I, I, I think just draw your attention here to the change over the last five years. It's significant, right? It's it's tripled over that time. And even the last year, it's gone up um, 30%. So we are really seeing some momentum as a result of some concerted efforts in this space. 
And I think the uh, other component there is the female chairs. There's now 30 and 11 appointed in the last year. So another 50% increase in the last year. We're really starting to see some momentum here, which we, we hope will continue uh, onto the next one, please. So on cultural background, um, we feel the governance is due in the water and watermark search. This is probably moving slower than we would hope. Um, diversity of culture is certainly, it's moving in the right direction, but at a glacial pace is the word that we're, we're using. Um, on the current trajectory, it'll take another 18 years to be reflective of Australia's population, which we feel is far too long. Um, on these definitions, we've used the Australian Human Rights Commission in their article leading for change. So Anglo-Celtic is typically Commonwealth or UK uh, centric history. European is what it says on the tin and then non-European is effectively the rest of the world. And this is where we see Asian cultural heritage come through in, the, in that non-European component. So across the 300, um, it's quite a minute amount, as you can see, 7.5% for rest of the world. If we go down another level into the 100, where we feel a lot of these uh, moves are made quite earlier on, they can, these organisations are typically on the front foot with these, is that it's, it's a significant shift, right? That's 18%, that's a significant step forward. And we saw the same with gender about five years ago. They were the leaders on gender, and now they're again the leaders on cultural diversity. So I'm sure we'll come back to that through the discussion. Next slide, if we could, thanks. On skills and experience, the, the trend continues that women hold more qualifications than men when they go into the boardroom. Um, <clears throat> and that's been consistent. And if anything, that's increasing. Um, we've also seen uh, a slight increase in the governance qualifications for women as well. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that, but roughly 40% of directors have a governance qualification now. And that's again, a significant change from even a few years ago. I think the other component worth highlighting is that gone are the days where the boardroom was filled with eight accountants and two lawyers. Um, the, the accounting background is certainly decreasing. We've seen that for a number of years and we're continuing to see that. So it's down to under 35% now. We think it'll go down even further to about 30% and then we think it will, it'll, it'll be stable from there. So where are those additional skills coming from? One of them is technology we've highlighted there. Look, it's coming from a slow base. Um, but even the last five years, it's increased 50%, even the last year, it's increased 20%. So we think that's a trend that's going to continue on the technology skills. The next one, please. Age, not a lot of change on age. 5% of directors are under 50 years of age. Um, and, you know, there's a slight difference there between the men and the women. But historically, you know, the top ASX boards want to see significant amount of corporate experience and you don't get that from your university days. So we think that's going to stabilise. We might see a bigger spread there, but we don't see a lot of change in the near term. On the next one, please. Tenure and independence, this is an interesting one. We are seeing less um, of the scenario where directors are on boards for longer and longer in 15 years. The guideline of that 10 year window is certainly holding true. Um, <clears throat> one in five directors are regarded as non-independent. If you take out CEOs and managing directors, then that number falls significantly to about one in 20. And so we think that's a that's a healthy balance on, on that one. So look, it's, it's a comprehensive report. There's 23 pages of wonderful rich data. If you're interested, feel free to jump on the Governance Institute website or Watermark Search and you can download it for free. But they're, they're the highlights. So over to you, Megan. Wonderful, thank you so much, David. And uh, we've also had a question come through if though if this slide deck will be made available to the attendees, and I'm sure that we can somehow make that happen. So uh, I'll leave that with the, the Watermark team, but I think that would be great. So look straight into the questions, and I really wanna cover the topic off at, at really four levels, because there are um, social reasons why this is the case. And I want to tr I try and unpick the why a little bit for, for a lot of this. And there's some obviously some sort of deep social reasons why uh, that we need to overcome. There's also institutional reasons, that is, um, you know, some of the structural impediments that, have, that, that occur in business itself. Um, there's also uh, some work around, you know, creating the pipeline and so creating the, the product, if you like, for the market. And then there's a real question around, you know, joining the dots between those things, because it's no point having, you know, great pool of 
of diverse candidates and boards that want them if we're not able to connect those things. So I, I want to touch on that as well. But uh, Jason, look, I might throw to you first. You've done a lot of talking in the past around the deep cultural and structural impediments to diversity, which is where we sort of want to start off with. And, and in particular, you know, we know that there's been very traditional gender models in Australia, uh, you know, um, traditionally, you know, Annabelle Krabs written about the, the wife drought, you know, men are the workers, women are the home carers. Uh, I remember Liz Broderick talking uh, many years ago about saying, you know, the Australian definition of a good mum is um, mum whose kids are with them all the time. You know, they must be down RSL smoking, drinking and gambling. But if the kids are under the chair, somehow they're still the definition of good mum as opposed to off working in the workforce. Um, Jason, do you want to talk a little bit about how, our, how we have that unconscious bias and it's deeply ingrained in, in us in terms of not just gender but you know people who look different from us people who sound different from us and and in particular you know what do we do to what do we do to um, open our eyes to un unconscious bias and 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 handle it in a more productive way thanks so much megan and hi everyone it's um really great to be here today and let me acknowledge the traditional owners of uh, the land from where i'm beaming in um as well from sydney um Thanks for the question, Megan. It's a really good one. And it, I think it goes to the heart of some of these really big sort of cultural um, structural issues uh, around diversity. I, I, I've been talking about diversity for you know decades in, in a lot of contexts, political context, social context. The board context is an interesting one because the board is, is, a, is a small group that is meant to function very collegiately um hopefully very uh, effectively but it's really like a little circle of trust uh, which kind of makes it a little bit different from a political context or a broader social context but i think a lot of the same arguments kind of apply and one of the barriers that i think all of us face um because it's a really human thing is that we're biased towards people who are like us right you know and um you know that old saying in business books, you should only hire people who you can stand sitting next to um, on a three hour flight sort of somewhere, you know, that old sort of adage that seems so ingrained and it's a natural human disposition. You, you bias towards people who look like you, who think like you, who have a similar background, who you get on with, get your jokes, can go down to the pub and have a drink with, you know, that's the normal way of doing things. Overlaid on that, in a board context is the sense that you want to, you don't want a dysfunctional board, right? You want a board that gels, um, that's valued aligned, um, that can have good discussions. Um, so this to me is, is, a, is a tension between how do you get more diverse voices? How do you specifically find people who think different, who are different, from you are and the way you are, but still maintain the really important things that make boards gel and make boards work. And, and it's about nuance and judgment here. So you want to make sure that your directors, your diverse directors have the same value sets, right? Have a shared view of purpose, have a shared understanding of how a board is meant to work together. But you don't want them all to think alike. And striking that balance um, is partly the skill of a chair, partly about the culture um, that you have within a boardroom setting, partly about how you design your board sort of processes um, and, 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 and principles, and you know, partly about the sort of people that you actually do uh, select. So I don't think this is a formula, there's no one formulaic approach, but these these are some of the tensions um, and the complexities in this um, in this field and in this debate. I think that's right. And I, I think talking about those complexities is part of acknowledging that they exist. And in fact, our uh, Governance Institute is doing a piece of work around the future of, of the board. And we've been doing some work around what chairs roles are doing in terms of evolution. And it's a lot harder to chair a diverse board than it is to chair a board of homogeneous individuals that you know, all look and think the same. So the, uh, I think the, the role of the chair, the skill set that chairs need to bring to the table is going yeah. to 
Yeah, and how do you manage dissent? I mean, it's one of the hardest things from a structural and legal perspective. How do you manage dissent? But how do you disagree well? Is is a you know is a way to is a way to uh, describe it such that dissenting directors can feel like they're actually heard, but that also goes to how do your board make decisions, right? Does your board make decision by consensus where everybody is meant to agree and there might be some people who don't really agree, but how do you make sure everybody's voice is heard? How do you make sure that, that their opinions are respected? But if there is dissent, how do you manage that dissent in a, in a productive and constructive way? Indeed, indeed. Now, we've got lots of questions coming through. They're coming through chat and through the Q&A. If you could put your questions in the Q&A, that would be absolutely fantastic. I've got about four different screens open on my on my uh, laptop here. So that would be absolutely fantastic. If, you, if you're if you throwing a question in the chat, if you could throw it in the Q&A, that would be uh, absolutely fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask you and really go then to uh, the same similar sorts of issues that Jason talked about, but looking at how we unpick them in the organisational level itself. So Shirley, you've, um, you know, we've talked in our, in our pre-chat about the structural barriers that still exist within organisations themselves from pushing particularly women and chief executive women uh, produced a great piece of research this week that say things are getting better at the boardroom, but they're not getting better in the executive ranks. And so, you know, how do we unpick then what that culture looks like cascading through the rest of the organisation so that those unconscious biases are at least caught through a little bit more structural rigour in organisations. Would you comment on that? Thanks, Megan. And I'd like to start by acknowledging that I'm on Camera Eagle land and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. Um, look, uh, it's a really important question. I can't tell you how many times companies have said to me, look, you know, we are so ready to hire women and Indigenous people and, uh, you know, people from diverse cultures and people of disability, but we can't find them or they don't want to come and work for us and we've done everything we can. I think um, embedded in every organisation to some degree are structural and unconscious biases and it's about looking at unpicking every single process in your organization and I can give you a few examples it's from kind of the graduate level that you bring people in right through to how you retain people and so at the graduate level I worked with a company who used to run their they had this graduate employment night where they get applications they pick the top 50 applications it would be on a Friday afternoon kids would come in at four o'clock they'd stay till midnight and when we unpicked the process, we realized that actually the only people in the process were kids from the eastern suburbs or very close to the city who could catch an Uber or a taxi home at 12 o'clock because kids from the western suburbs who had an hour and a half travel home or from Western Sydney University couldn't pay for an Uber. Often on a Friday night, they were working because they had to help pay the rent at home. Um, they didn't feel safe traveling into the city at that time or home. So there are all these unconscious and structural biases in the process that nobody had thought of. And so what they were actually doing was hiring the same person to come into the company and then go through the ranks. And they were surprised that there was nobody coming in who was different. Another example is companies that have a reconciliation action plan and they're often really good plans, but they sit in the bottom drawer and only come out for Reconciliation Week or NAIDOC Week. And so First Nations people can't be their authentic selves every day of the year. And I think ultimately it's about looking at your processes and how you do everything. So this is not something that gets bolted on in HR. It's something that every team in the organization has to take accountability for. And looking at how you are preventing people from bringing their authentic selves to work every day because that's ultimately what creates a truly diverse organisation, not just the hiring, not just the box ticking, but making sure that those people can be themselves. And like Jason said, feel free to challenge the status quo, feel free to, to give their opinions, because that's why we want the diversity. Indeed. And, and I mean, the story that you told just resonated strongly with me. I actually remember going back about 10 years ago um, when I just had my first child 
and I was invited to speak at a, a, a women in construction event. I, I used to be in the, the building construction sector and it was at uh, four o'clock uh, in the afternoon or five till seven at night and they <laughs> wanted me to come and talk about how to balance having young children and working full time. And I said, well, the first thing is you don't do things at five o'clock at night because that's when you're trying to get the kids into bed and go home and actually be a mum. So, you know, and they, there was like a light bulb. They went, oh, we never thought our, most of our audience will be alienated in that time yeah. slot. So it does sometimes, you know, take a really thinking about things differently. David, I wanted to ask you about this though, because you must see organisations that come and say to you, David, I got to tick a box, you know, I need, I need a woman or I need someone in tech or I need, you know, a, you know it's someone with a, an Asian background or, you know, someone that new on the board. We've got all people that have been on the board for 20 years. What are you seeing in the market, though, with regards to how that marries up with the culture of the organisation you're trying to make a placement in? We, we see it more often than we'd like to, I must say. We regularly get calls from chairs and boards saying we need to achieve X target. Yeah. Um, and when and, it, and whenever they start the conversation like that, I know it's always going to be an interesting one. But um, regularly what we're seeing now is that uh, directors are asking chairs and asking the organisation, what is your approach? You know, if, if I'm going to be on the board to tick a box, I don't want to be on that board because you're not really encouraging diversity in the intent you know you're, you're doing it to achieve um, a metric and what we what we're finding is that the savvy candidates the savvy directors the savvy executives are asking those questions what's your policy on diversity and inclusion and then tell me how you're implementing it and how is it working for you and how do you evolve it and what's measured on that are the executives incentives tied to that in any way how is it actually really where the rubber hits the road and what impact are you making on that what's your policy on asg and, and a lot of chairs and boards have been caught out by these questions by candidates. These candidates are in, in high demand. We know there's pressure on them. And I think that if, you, if you're approaching it in the sense that I just need to achieve this, this target, you won't get the best talent because they're asking more questions of you than you're probably asking of them. Yeah, absolutely. And I uh, once again, talking about the, the acceleration of that war and, in, and intensification of that war for talent, given the, the labour market at the moment, uh, I think that's only set to continue and to keep holding boards to account and organisations to account. Um, Jason, we've had a fantastic question come in through the Q&A and it, it leads back to something that we've talked about. And I know that you're uh, being on the board of AsiaLink and that is how do you measure the hidden demographics? And even in the watermark search, David, you and I talked about the, the methodology for making you know, an, an assessment as to what someone's nationality was, uh, you know, their, their cultural background. Um, but there's a lot of hidden demographics. And of course, just because someone looks Chinese doesn't mean they're Asian capable or Asian knowledgeable, for example. So how do you really um you know how do you measure some of those hidden demographics that would speak to diversity you know for example lgbtqi or uh you know first nations but it's not it's not always obvious by the color of one's skin and how one looks is it it's not um although you know it, it's it's a tricky topic in the sense that um from an Asia link perspective um one would be attracting a certain amount of criticism if we were to go, all right, we need Asian expertise um, on our board and all the people that we pick with Asian expertise don't have an Asian background. Um, that, that, would, uh, that would be a controversial um, decision. And so, again, it, it comes down to judgment and, and nuance. You were right. There would be people with an Asian background who may know very little uh, about, I mean, we're talking in big generalities here. I was going to say, no, nothing about Asia, but what is it about Asia that your organization actually wants to know? Do you want to market to consumers in a particular part of Asia? Are you looking to partner or joint venture with a particular sort of organization or group of organizations, you know, from a particular country in Asia? And does your candidate have the requisite skills, experience, background, relationships in order to um, be able to do that. And some of it is very cultural um, as well. You know, uh, 
as, as people would know, doing business in Asia, a lot of it, um, there is a particular mindset and an, a bunch of um, very nuanced, particular cultural sensitivities that are that are important. Um, and it is not to say that if you're not Asian, you can't learn these things or do these things. But generally speaking, if you look at Australians who have had, Australians executives who have had significant Asian, like, like not flying there a couple of times a year, but actually having lived and worked full-time based in Asia, um, it's a relatively small pool. Um, so I think that in short, I, I think it, it's, it's a challenging thing to say, you know, you don't have to be Asian to get Asia in the sense that we don't want that to be um, a whitewashing of things. You know, similarly, it would, be, it would be very challenging, I'd imagine, to say non-Indigenous people, non-Indigenous people deeply understand the issues that Indigenous people uh, face. That it's, it's, it's challenging ground, I would, I, I would argue. Megan, can I just add something to that? Please, Sorry. Joe, I'm going to throw to you, yes. No, I think this, and look, this might be quite controversial, but can I just say that the colour of my skin is all at once the least and most important thing about me. So it's the least important thing because I bring a range of skills to the table, like Jason and, and other people of a diverse background. I bring, you know, my legal skills, my risk hat, my NFP hat, my Indigenous experience. I bring a whole range of things. But it is the most important thing about me because it has dictated the lens through which I see the world for my entire experience. And it has dictated the way that I interact with the world and the world interacts with me. And so when organisations are looking to why they need diversity on their boards, they need to be unpicking how their boards reflect the audience they're selling to and that they're targeting, how um, their boards reflect that experience. And so the reason that I would hope that a board looks to me for inclusion is not because of the colour of my skin, but because of the experience that that brings and the lens through which all my other skills are deployed because of that. Does that, yeah. does that make sense? It's, you know, we shouldn't be looking for a board seat because I've got brown skin. That's missing the point. It's because of the diversity of experience that that's connected to. Absolutely. And if I can use that actually as a leeway to talk about something that we were talking about before, and that is, you know, some of the, you know, some of the pundits will say, oh, you know, it's just become a box ticking, ticking exercise. And how am I supposed to tick every single box? You know, I'm supposed to have a LGBTQI and I'm supposed to have someone with multicultural background and I'm supposed to have an Indigenous and I need a certain quota of women and I tick box X, Y, Z and then, you know, go on and go forth. Um, the reality is you can't do that, of course, and not have a board of, you know, 30 odd, odd people. And that's kind of not the point of diversity. The point of diversity is not to check that you've got everything. It's to make sure that you've got more than just one thing. Uh, and, and it's the conversation that that promotes. Um, we, we talked a, a little bit before about um, the, about, Sorry, I've, I think I've got a young person um, behind me, which is what happens in a uh, lockdown world. My apologies. Um, the uh, so, and I've just lost my train of thought. We were talking about um, the conversation that becomes very important, but also I wanted to talk about the behaviours in the boardroom that we use to make sure that it's not just about diversity, but it's also about inclusion. Because I have seen situations, for example where you know, the board gets a young person on the board and then they sit around saying things like, oh yes, but when you're as experienced as we are, or you know, oh, I used to think that when I was your age. And so they marginalize the voice pretty quickly. So what are some of the lessons that you think chairs and other directors need to learn to, to check their own unconscious bias so that they're truly being inclusive in the boardroom and giving genuine voice to the different perspectives that people bring to the table. Jason, I'm going to start with you on this one. You're smiling and I, I'm sure that you've got I, something to I'm, add. I'm just, I'm just smiling because it makes me think of, um, so I, I sit on the board of the University of Sydney and our former vice chancellor, um, who, who aside from running the university also, uh, decided that he'd do a, a degree in Korean um, at, at the university. He, he told us a story uh, once in a board meeting where he was sitting in a Korean class and he noticed 
that um, the Asian students or the Korean students in the class um, weren't saying a lot um, in tutorials. And his immediate reaction was, okay, well, how do we encourage the Korean students to speak up more? And, you know, he understood that this was a deep cultural thing, et cetera. But then he had an epiphany. He thought, maybe it's not about getting the Korean uh, students to speak up more. Maybe the problem is in the way that the class was designed um, in a very sort of, you know, Western way. Maybe it's in the way that the lecturer or the, or the tutor was asking the questions and delivering it. So maybe there was a way to organise the tutor in a different way so as to encourage students who are, you know, more, you know, shyer and, or their cultural context means they don't, they're not as boisterous um, to, to be heard. And we thought that that was a really, that was a really powerful um, insight. Also at the, uh, the university is an interesting board because it is mandated that um, there are two directors, uh, they're called Senate Fellows, who are students, a postgrad student and an undergrad student, student. And there are two staff fellows. So in other words, that there are two employees that are structurally on the board. And so in a way, the voices um, are kind of uh, uh, are baked in, in, in. And so the, the, the challenge is, is absolutely right. How, how and what they say and the insights that they bring um, are tremendously valuable because they bring a perspective that we wouldn't normally um, uh, think of. But all of that said, often um, they don't have the confidence to speak up. They feel like that they are in the minority and may not have, particularly at the beginning of their tenure, because the fellows change regularly. They, they're generally on one or two year terms. And so there's a lot of renewal there. And so there is a process in which um, one needs to educate them and train them in respect of their board duties. You know, this is a board, it's not a parliament. This is how we're meant to work together. And what is the right way in order to be effective and in order to be, uh, to be heard? Yeah, fabulous. Um, Shirley, did you have anything to add on that? Yeah, look, I think, you know, I chair the Women's Agenda Leadership Awards and one of the um, challenges we face each year is looking for leadership in a guise other than that that we've been raised to look for it in. Does that make sense? It's, you know, we, we have been trained over decades to think that leadership is to walk into a room, to take control of the room, to be articulate in a particular way to be hold a pose in a certain way to have a certain level of arrogance it's a white older males kind of you know view of leadership um and i think we have to challenge ourselves that when we're looking for the, the that diversity on a board and we so if we've understood why we want it we understood why we need it um then it's looking for it and it's challenging yourself to think that the quiet person who walks into a room who doesn't say much and needs encouragement or needs to be given tools to speak up that person might be as fabulous a leader as that other type of person it may actually, it may actually suit your organization better um you know we don't we just need to challenge ourselves on looking for leadership in different guises and even after we've identified that we need diversity, that is still a challenge because often when we're talking about people from diverse backgrounds, they don't speak up. They don't look you in the eye when they talk to you. You know, there are cultural limitations on, um, on their behavior. They've been brought up in a certain way. We have to um, work around that and with that because that's how we get the best talent around that table. Indeed. And, and go for it. Yeah. But could I just make an addition. I mean, through through our corporate advisory work, um, we've been involved in a number of board sort of uh, processes in Asia and has seen some really interesting stuff, how in the actual board meeting, everyone kind of agrees, but the debate has actually happened outside of the actual board meeting. So, so often what the really good chairs will do is they will ring up all of the board directors actually in a quiet and safe environment, understand what their concerns are and what they think and steward it um, so that within the board meeting itself, it is 
culturally appropriate in the sense that in a lot of Asian cultures, you don't want to have that big Barney um, in public in the boardroom. And so we saw a bunch of really interesting behaviours towards effectiveness in, a, in, a, in an Asian context. Yeah, I was actually going to um, say the exact same thing. And it's like, I think that once again, it comes down to the skill of the chair to understand how to get the best. And I go back to you know, a long, long time ago when I was a school teacher. And of course, all kids, you know, and your own included, will say, you know, oh, that's not fair, mum. I didn't get the same as he, him. And, and the, the reality is, is that the definition of fairness is not about everyone getting the same thing. It's not about equity. It's actually about each person getting what they need to participate and succeed in their own right. And, and you're right, Jason, some people will be much more comfortable in different contexts for different reasons, having a quiet one-on-one -on -one with the chair than they will in the middle of the board room meeting their view. The other thing that I've really noticed is that um, good chairs are using technology platforms like this to create a more equal playing field so that the directors that are the most vociferous, uh, you know, they get their say, but then, right, you put yourself on mute and then they go around the Brady Bunch screen and actually do make time to have not just the loudest voices speaking over everyone in the room, but everyone has an opportunity to speak one by one. So I think there's a lot for chairs learning to use this new technology to their advantage as well. Megan, can I just ask, can I, can I jump in and ask a question? I'd be interested in David's view, just on from a recruitment perspective, are you seeing chairs look for those different leadership qualities when they're looking for diversity? I think the, the savvy chairs uh, are going another level down in terms of, yes, we appreciate the value of diversity, but how are you embracing it and how are you incorporating it into your day-to-day -day decision-making processes. Yeah, there's been some really good nuggets from everyone on the panel today and how we can all do that better. But I think the chairs then also encourage the rest of the board to ask those questions. You know, Megan used a really good example before around, well, when you get to my experience, you'll see the world in my way. It's like, well, actually, no, that's not what we want on the board. And you need to stamp those comments out quickly. And more often than not, they don't come from the chair because the, typically, in many senses, the chairs are quite... Um, have a, quite a broad perspective on this. But there are some uh, board directors that don't. And, and, and one or two of those comments can really diminish the tone of encouraging this diversity and inclusion that so many people can be working so hard for. So I think it's, it's the chair, but that's then going another level down going, right, what is the executive team doing? And what are our graduates doing around asking these questions? And how are we encouraging them to speak up? And who are we hiring? And how are we hiring them? And how are we creating a roadmap for those people through the organisation? I, I think there's layers to this that, to my earlier point around, if, if people are looking at this to tick a box, it's not going to work. And, and the savvy candidates and the savvy executives are well attuned to that. They don't want to be that token person on, on the board of the exec team because that's not their contribution either. That They've got a, a bigger contribution they can make in an organisation that's going to be appreciated. Um, David, I want to throw to you for the next question. I'm going to come back to you, Shirley. Actually, before we do that, we'll go to the next poll question. Um, and the next poll question is, is really about this. Beyond gender, how important is diversity uh, as the uh, part of the discussion in your boardroom? So in, when you were next to appoint a board director, how important is diversity outside of gender? Uh, and, and how broad is that broader conversation happening? So if we... Just um, give a moment to that. Now, Shirley, I'm going to come back because you talked about, I want to come back to the individual, the candidates themselves. If you're out there uh, on, in webinar land listening to us right now and you're looking for a board seat, you're looking to position yourself for a next executive or an NED position, it's got to be more about just being a diverse candidate, you know, drawing on the elements of diversity. So I'm going to come to, to you on that. And then, David, I want to come back to you about making the connections because I remember for years you know um, boards saying you know we just can't find the women candidates they're just not out there there's not enough of them and yet we've been you know 52 percent of the population and 54 percent of the university educated population for some three decades now so clearly there are there's lots of meritorious candidates out there and I'm going to come to you David in terms of you know what is the search industry doing in terms of making sure that you're connecting in with that pipeline of talent it means looking further than you know the old mates network because that's what gave us what we had before so you know what is the search industry doing so first to you Shelley, it looks it, it's a priority for the people on the call that's 
probably a, a byproduct of the people that have given up an hour of their time to listen to this conversation, but that is great news. Um, now, I'm going to come to you, Shirley, on that question of it's got to be about more than just being a diverse candidate. What do candidates need to think about in terms of making that next step? The best advice I ever received from a mentor of mine was um, to work out what your value proposition is. So if you're in a lineup with 50 people who look like you and have your experience, what is it that's going to make you stand out? And that, you know, as a board candidate, that was that's an incredibly difficult thing to do. It's not just that you're a lawyer or you've got accounting experience or that you're a CEO or that you're a CRO. It's actually working out what your personal narrative is. Um, and that changes per board and per industry and per sector, like your value prop for one might be slightly different or nuanced with compared to your value prop for another. Uh, and so for me, it was really about working out what that was. And once you nail that, I think it's really easy because it's very incredibly authentic. It's who you are and um, it's the lens through which you see the world. Mm. Jason, just quickly, what advice would you give to candidates? I'd agree with um, Shirley there, and and that is, uh, I mean, the key point is about being authentic, um, because if you're not authentic, people will 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 see through it, um, sort of in an in in an instant. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't I don't have anything to add to that. I completely agree. Fantastic. All right, now David, back to you and that tricky question: What's Watermark doing in terms of matching up this fabulous pool of candidates that we know are out there? We've got some phenomenal talent in the country. What do we do to prime them up, make sure they're ready, and then connect them in with the boards? Yeah, look, it's 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 an interesting one, and and um, thankfully it's not that easy. Otherwise, I might be doing a, a different job because everyone could do it. But I think um, <clears throat> the same pressure and this on on a similar topic was on gender only five years ago. You know, where are we going to get all these female executives to come onto the board? And the reality is that we've achieved the first hurdle of that we've made a big step on that. So I think that. You made the point, Mega, and what gets measured gets done. And I think that that there are other people out there. We just have to go and find them. And in terms of how you know we're supporting and how the broader economy is supporting them, there are lots of avenues for people um, to one uh, put themselves out there and do additional qualifications. You know, we saw earlier on the statistics that only forty percent of uh, ASX rendered directors have a governance qualification. Right? Is that enough? Yeah, I don't know. I don't want to go there, but. The, we get regular conversations where someone in their early 50s comes to Watermark, says, okay, great, David, I'm ready to start my board career. And the first thing I say to them, well, you should have called me 10 years ago. That This is something that you need to start planning on, you know, it, in your 30s or 40s in your career. If you feel that you have the potential and the aspiration to be a board director, it, it, in many cases, on the individual to start thinking about how they could do that. And I would suggest qualification is a start. The second part around what the search industry is doing is that at Watermark, we have this uh, belief and the data proves it that the best performing candidates, executive or board directors aren't out there going home at seek or night applying for a new job. You know, they're engaged in what they're doing. They are determined to achieve that next hurdle. They're engaged in their board. They're engaged in their annual report or whatever is that hurdle in their, in their life. And it's not until a firm like ours or some of our competition go and approach them and say, hey, have you ever thought about doing something different? Who's your, who's your mentor? Who would you like to connect with? Who do you think you can learn from? And we are seeing execs from different backgrounds approach mentors. And more often than not, those mentors, those CEOs, those board directors are more than willing to give their time. And we, we actually, at Watermark, we connect them. We also have a, a boardroom table and a boardroom lunch where we talk about getting experienced chairs into a webinar. We used to do them in person. And we hope to get there again soon but we have aspirational directors come and listen to experienced chairs around what makes a good board director. How do you be authentic and put your case forward like Shirley and Jason were just talking about? So I think it's leveraging the experience for God, applying what we've, some of the good work we've done on other aspects such as gender, and then applying it to the, the cultural lens um, in how we can sort of shift this forward as, as a cohort. Indeed, indeed. And, and I, I think, I, please Jason. Sorry, can I just, just listening to David, can I jump in here with a with a um, observation? And that is, um, there's, there should be a lot of thought about the sorts of companies or organisations that you want to be a director of. I, I don't think it's a matter of going there, I want to be a director and just going for the first thing that, 
that that comes up or the you know uh, or going for the trophy directorships you know i think there's a lot of thought that should go into what sort of company you want to work for now obviously you want to work for companies that reflect your own values that you're deeply sort of interested in um, and have a very good reason um, for that, number one. But there's also, I think, a question of, do you want to go for listed company boards, in particular big listed company boards? Now, they're obviously trophy boards and there's a lot of sort of prestige attached uh, to that. But it comes with a different side, you know, as you know, there are questions around liability, around does this uh, around reputation around ability to influence um and so there are questions around do you really want a big sort of asx 50 list company board or will you be more effective working in a private equity or a venture capital invested growth company um and really help them grow in your area of expertise so i mean there's a, a lot of thinking to be done in what is the right sort of company and space for you. And I think that comes down to the value proposition that Shirley was talking about and yourself, Jason. Um, you know, how do I add value? You know, where 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 can I add the most value if I've got experience in you know rapid business expansion? Then maybe that startup space is better for you than a blue chip. So you could you because you can add value in that space. And maybe can I just add to that? Sorry, I think it's the, what the thing that Jason just talked about is really hard to fight against. You know, you when you've finished your exec role or you're transitioning and you're looking for boards, it is so flattering to have anybody offer you a board. And so you automatically think, actually, I, I just want to be a director. And so I think that is a really, everyone's got to fight against that. Mm -hmm. um, and just understanding your value proposition is a really big part of it, but also understanding your value and not just saying yes to everything, because I think we all have a tendency to do that, especially women and women of colour and women, you know, people from minorities, we all, everyone tends to think, oh no, but that, you know, that's been offered to me, it's quite flattering. Yeah, I, I agree with that. Um, now we've got some great questions and we've only, I mean, I knew that we were going to run out of time. There, there's just so much that we haven't even got through, um, that we have some good questions. And I particularly want to touch on this one um, because it talks to tenure and age. And we we have talked a, a, a little bit more around some of the other aspects. But the question here is, um, how, have you seen organisations create effective board turnover? Trying to achieve diversity by waiting for people to retire will be a slow process, and we know that's true. How do we encourage directors to act by stepping aside or making way, especially when it's obvious that a board lacks diversity? Jason, I'm going to pitch this one to you first. Have you ever seen a benevolent uh, director that says, "Look, I've still got right, you know, I've still got life in me yet, but in the interests of the organisation and the broader broad skills matrix and diversity matrix." I'm going to make way. Look, it's pretty rare. I haven't seen I haven't seen much of that. Um, to be, I, I mean, occasionally, sort of, yes, people people have gone. Look, I I think I've you know I've done you know eight years, ten years. It's time to go, and it's time to refresh. There are some organisations where it's mandated, um, where you know two five year terms or two four year terms, and and you know that's that's the limit. And I think that's a very, I think that's a very healthy thing. Um, I think some of it will be driven, hopefully, um, by by need, particularly around the increasing role that um, technology um, is playing in uh, companies and technology in a broad sense, not just technology from a cybersecurity or cyber risk perspective, but technology in respect of how do you market to customers, technology and what is the risk that there's 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 the startup that's going to come to wipe mm -hmm. out your by a business in the space of two years that you didn't see um, sort of coming. Um, and that speaks to the importance of having generational change, um, having millennials, having people who see the world through an entirely different lens. Um, and if you've only got so many board seats and you are desperately lacking that sort of insight, um, something's got to give. Yeah. Can, I, can I add something to that? I think um, <clears throat> I. I couldn't agree more. Where we've seen it work at Watermark is that we have worked with a couple of boards on creating subcommittees within the board. So, for example, we've created a development committee for an organisation that composed of some execs within that organisation, but also externally. And what we've given the task to of those directors is to mentor and coach some of those development committee. 
And what we tend to find is that still boards this day are very reactive around, I'm up to my third term, I'm going to have to go, oh my goodness, we've got to find another board director before the next AGM nomination. And you'd be surprised how often that happens. And what we've found is that if we start this process earlier in terms of succession planning and giving development committee an opportunity to mentor some people that we've actually found some directors to say, you know what, it's my time to go. I've groomed the next person and I'm happy with the direction in which we're taking with this board. And we have actually seen a couple of directors opt out a bit earlier on that front. That's wonderful. Shirley? Yeah, no, I agree with everything that Jason and David have said. I don't think I have anything to add on that. Excellent. Well, look, we literally have four minutes left. Um, what I wanted to finish off with is, you know, a closing comment from each of you very quickly. And in particular, you know, if there's a piece of advice that you could give either to the chairs or the directors that are sitting on the call today on this webinar, or the executives, if there's a piece of advice that you'd like to impart in terms of an actionable item that they go away with, to help move the dial in terms of diversity, not just on gender, but um, diversity right across the spectrum, uh, what would that be? So I'm going to start, I'll, I'll, I'll go across with Jason Shirley and then leave with, finish off with you, David. Um, my closing thing is around 40, 40, 20, right? So, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a powerful sort of uh, mantra in terms of gender. How do we take 40, 40, 20 and expand it and make it relevant to, you know, cultural diversity? and a broader definition of diversity. Um, and maybe, maybe that can in some way be encapsulated in that 20%, in that in the 20% in the 40-40-20 in the around that flexibility to, to ensure that the 20% means that there is broad diversity um, in your organisation, not just in your boardroom, but in your, in your organisation. Fantastic. Shelley? I think look, I agree with the 40, 40, 20. I think it is such a great idea that we haven't, um, we didn't talk about today, but um, we really need to be. I think for me, it's about, you know, we've hit 30% on ASX 200 boards for gender um, inclusion. That's not enough. I mean, as Megan said, we're 50% of the population or more. We need to be pushing ourselves constantly. But I think it's also not enough to think that, you know, we'll do gender, then after gender, we'll do multiculturalism and after that we'll do first nations and after that we'll do disability it's not uh, you know a hierarchy of diversity that you tick off we need to think of all of it together and um i think from a board perspective it's really asking yourself sure it's about getting the people around the table but then it's about asking yourself in your organization what are the the structural the cultural the unconscious biases that we have embedded in either the language we use, the processes we use, the way we engage with our customers, our suppliers, our employees that are shutting people out. And it's fine to think you want diversity, but diversity needs to want you. And uh, it's a two way street. So I think there's a lot of work to be done. It's not just about hiring people. That really annoys me when we when people talk about diversity as you know, a certain number of employees, it's not that at all. It's a much deeper thing. And you need to um, examine the paradigms you've created in your organization. Indeed, David. My final point would just be on the timing and the urgency of this. You know, it, it echoes what Shirley was saying. It's not around the next appointment. You know, it can start now. Whether you're a candidate, think about how you can get on the radar. Think about how you could get on a committee. Think about how you could do a qualification. And for directors, don't wait for the next nomination. What are you doing now? What are you, who are you networking with? Who are you talking to? What strategies are you implementing today to try and make a difference on this? Because if you leave it to the last minute, it's not as effective. We've seen it. So I'd encourage, encourage people to get onto it as soon as practical. Fantastic. And look, we, we've had, um, I, I, we've got lots and lots of questions that didn't unfortunately get answered today. We, we could have continued this conversation on for a long, lot longer. Um, didn't have time to do so, but I would say, you know, my, my two cents in the mix there is exactly as David said, take action. Don't say you're passionate about it. Take action. So, and, and there are reams of paper um, from various organisations on what those actions might be. Next time you're asked to speak at a conference, ask what's the diversity look like of the overall conference program. Don't speak on a panel, there's no diversity. Make sure that you're asking the question in your own organisation. Does your executive know their statistics? Do you know your pay gap analysis? 
you know, take action because it's only when we really know what's going on that we can lift the lid and shine sunlight on the issue. So don't say you're passionate if you're not prepared to do some do something tangible about it is my strong message. Look, thank you so, so much to our panellists today. Jason, Shirley, David, you've been wonderful. David's been wonderful to partner with Watermark Search International. We're really, really proud of the work. It's really important that we continue the conversation because we are not there yet, not by a long shot. And uh, we've got more work to do. So I look forward to continuing that. Likewise. Thank you, Megan, for hosting such a great session. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone.